Greetings, everyone. So for this session, I am going to be walking you through some anatomy questions and talking you through some of the logic when it comes to answering these questions. Um, and this PowerPoint with the questions and the slides that uh, have the explanations for the answers will be available to you along with the video itself. So we'll get started. Question one. A 21-year-old man injures his right arm in an automobile accident. Radiographic examination reveals a fracture of the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Which of the following nerves is most likely injured as a result of this accident? Okay, so I started us off with an easy one. This is what we call a one-step question. Um, thankfully, it's just knowing like, this is just, they give you a basic, basic scenario and you just have to go one step to get to where the answer is. If you fracture the medial epicondyle, what nerve will you injure? Pretty much is what this question is asking. So we know that the nerve that is passing behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus is our ulnar nerve. Now, if you weren't certain of this, if you couldn't quite remember, hopefully you will remember that your axillary nerve gets damaged if you fracture the cervical neck of the humerus, that your radial nerve will get damaged if you have a mid-shaft fracture of the humerus and that your median nerve can possibly get damaged if you have a supracondylar fracture. The musculocutaneous nerve isn't really associated with um, a fracture of the humerus. Let's see, ulnar nerve B is our answer. Here's a picture showing you again. Here's the medial epicondyle and here's the ulnar nerve passing posterior to it. The way that it helped me to remember this was that uh, the radial nerve is small, smart, the ulnar nerve is stupid because the radial nerve comes anteriorly in front of the humerus versus the ulnar nerve goes posteriorly behind it. So when you bend your elbow, you never have an issue with your radial nerve, but with your ulnar nerve, um, it's exposed. So when you like hit your elbow and it feels like that electric shock down your uh, forearm, that's you compressing your ulnar nerve. Okay, question two. A patient comes in with a gunshot wound and requires surgery in which his thoracocromial trunk needs to be ligated. Which of the following arterial branches would maintain normal blood flow? So this question requires you to know your vasculature. So it's asking about the thoracocromial trunk. So you would need to know what are the branches of your thoracocromial trunk. Well, we know from our mnemonic decap that the branches are your deltoid, your clavicular, your pectoral, and your acromial arteries. So all of these are a part of your thoracocromial trunk. So the only one that's not is your superior thoracic artery. So the answer again is E. So just showing you here, here's superior thoracic coming off by itself in that first part of our axillary artery versus your thoracocromial trunk is a part of that second part of uh, your axillary artery. You can see it's four branches shown here. Okay. Question three. A 29 year old man comes in with a stab wound, cannot raise his arm above horizontal, and exhibits a condition known as winged scapula. Which of the following structures of the brachial plexus would most likely be damaged? Okay. So this is going to take um, a couple of steps for you to figure out what the answer is. So, first thing that you can note is that wing scapula is used. So for wing scapula, you think of, okay, what are the things that I know about wing scapula? So it happens when it's paralysis of the psoriasis anterior muscle. Psoriasis anterior is innervated by long thoracic nerve. So it's asking you which of the following structures of the brachial plexus would most likely be damaged. Well, we have to know where a long thoracic nerve comes off of the brachial plexus. And if you'll recall, there's only two nerves that come off of the roots and one of them is long thoracic. So that's how you would get to your answer D here. For an upper trunk injury, remember that's our herb Duchenne palsy. For our lower trunk injury, that is clumpy. Um, for posterior cord, that you would think of more like radial nerve. Um, I'm trying to think of median cord. Don't hear about that very much, but it would be like ulnar nerve or median nerve because both those come off of the median cord. So there you have it, your roots. And again, here's the roots, here's your long thoracic nerve coming off. And then, yeah, just visualizing that brachial plexus 
and understanding that if you have the injury to the roots, long thoracic nerve, well, long thoracic nerve is an example versus posterior cord versus medial cord. Okay, question four. A 27 year old patient presents with an inability to draw the scapula forward and downward because of paralysis of the pec minor. Which of the following most likely cause be the cause of this condition? Okay, so for this question, you need to be able to visualize your pec minor, its origin and its insertion. Um, for pec minor, we know that it originates on the ribs and then it inserts on the coracoid process of the scapula. So fracture of our coracoid process would do that for us. Um, when it comes to fracture of the clavicle, well, pec minor doesn't insert on the clavicle. Injury to the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, well, pec minor is innervated by um, lateral pec and medial pec, so that wouldn't be an issue with us either. Axillary nerve injury, axillary nerve does not innervate pec minor, and then defects in the posterior wall of the axilla. No, that's, that's not, uh, that's more out of scope. So you can see, see, coracoid proxis fracture. And then here's our pec minor originating on the ribs and inserting on the coracoid process. Um, a random little nugget of information that just kind of stuck with me. There's only three muscles that insert on this coracoid process. Um, pec minor is one. The other two are the short head of your biceps brachii and your coracobrachialis. Coracobrachialis is way easier because it has like corco in the name. But those are the three muscles that insert on your coracoid process. Okay. Question five. A 16 year old boy fell from a motorcycle and his radial nerve was severely damaged because of a fracture of the mid shaft of the humerus. Which of the following conditions would most likely result from this accident? Okay, so we have a fracture of the mid shaft of the humerus. Recall all of your humerus fractures, mid shaft, if you fracture the humerus, you're gonna have radial nerve damage, possibly profunda brachii um, damage as well. For radial nerve damage, um, you think, okay, if I lose my radial nerve, what do I expect to see in my patient? So loss of wrist extension leading to wrist drop. This is like radial nerve damage, wrist drop, um, pretty much almost every time. Um, I'm just gonna double check the other answers just in case. So weakness in pronation of the forearm. Well, there's two muscles that pronate our forearm, pronated teres and pronated quadratus. Those are both innervated by median nerve, so that's not what we're looking for. Sensory loss of the, over the ventral aspect of the, uh, of the base of the thumb. So radial nerve does do some sensory innervation um, of the thumb, but wrist drop is more is a more accurate answer here versus C. Inability to oppose the thumb, well, that's opposing the pollicis, which is part of your thanar eminence, which is innervated by median nerve. And then inability to abduct the fingers. Well, abduction is from your dabs, your dorsal interossei, and that's ulnar nerve. So process of elimination, wrist drop, way more correct answer, especially since it's mid shaft of the humerus, like wrist drop, absolutely radial nerve damage. Answer is A. Again, all the fractures, you gotta know them. Unfortunately, you gotta know all of them. They'll keep coming back. Okay, question six. A 21 year old woman walks in with a shoulder and arm injury after falling during horseback riding. Examination indicates that she cannot adduct her arm because of paralysis of which of the following muscles. Okay, so this is you really knowing the actions of your muscles. So we're looking for a muscle that adducts the arm. Well, teres minor, that's one of our six muscles. We know that it abducts the arm, so it's not that one. Supraspinatus is um, the muscle that actually initiates abduction, so it's not that one. Infraspinatus is another um, rotator cuff muscle that abducts, so it's not that one. And serratus anterior is for wing scapula. So our answer is latissimus dorsi. Recall that latissimus dorsi is that muscle that helps you pull your body up towards your arms while you're doing pull-ups. Well, that's adduction. <laughs> That's the form of a deduction. So you're a deducting like the arm to the body. So your dorsi. Okay. 
Question seven. A 35-year-old man walks in with a stab wound to the most medial side of the proximal portion of the cubital fossa. The most medial side of the proximal portion of the cubital fossa. Which of the following structures would most likely be damaged? Okay, so you have to know what's inside of your cubital fossa and you have to know it like in order, lateral to medial, medial to lateral, whatever works for you. For me, when I was learning this, I may have done a little mnemonic that worked for my brain. Um, and the mnemonic was Robin beats bat man. So each one of those words corresponds to um, a structure in the cubital fossa. So Robin is for radial nerve. Beats is for biceps brachii tendon. Bat was for brachial artery. And then man is for median nerve. Um, and then I just remembered it was from lateral to medial. So the most medial structure in our cubital fossa is this median nerve. Um, and then radio, radial recurrent artery is just thrown in there to try and like trip you up. So again, my funny little mnemonic that works for my brain. Okay. So question eight. A 12 year old boy walks in. He fell out of a tree and fractured the upper portion of his humerus. So fracture of the upper portion of the humerus. Which of the following nerves, so we're looking for more than one nerve, are intimately related to the humerus and are most likely to be injured by such a fracture? Okay, so recall the fractures of the humerus that we talked about and we're talking about the upper portion. So not the lower two. The lower two were ulnar nerve because of the medial epicondyle and um, median nerve because of the uh, supracondylar fracture. So those are out. So anything that says median or ulnar, those are automatically out. That leaves us with axillary musculocutaneous or radial and axillary. Well, remember our surgical neck fracture is axillary and our mid shaft fracture is radial nerve. So the answer is C. Um, and I think I said this before, I don't think there's any like fracture of the humerus that causes damage to the musculocutaneous nerve. Um, so yeah, the answer should be C. And it is. Um, I threw in this picture of uh, your triangles and spaces just because it's another like good example of um, integrating information like in multiple different ways. So your radial nerve coming through the uh, triangular interval, or I think your professor calls it the lower triangular space, and then your um, axillary nerve coming through your quadrangular space, but showing both of them um, in like intimate relation with the upper portion of your humerus. Okay, question nine. An 18 year old boy involved in an automobile accident presents with an arm that cannot abduct, abduct. His paralysis is caused by damage to which of the following nerves? Okay, so we now have a child who can't abduct the arm. So that makes us think, okay, what muscles abduct the arm? So we know that supraspinatus starts it and then deltoid, uh, so supraspinatus zero to 15 and then deltoid 15 to 90. So what nerves innervate those two muscles? Well, we know that axillary nerve innervates the deltoid and then supraspinatus is innervated by your suprascapular nerve. So the answer should be A. And it is. So just a reminder of zero to 15 is supraspinatus, 15 to 90 is deltoid and then 90 to 120 is serratus anterior via rotation of your scapula. For the other nerves that were listed there, um, so musculocutaneous nerve, I don't believe has anything to do with abduction of the arm. Um, and then thoracodorsal is for your latissimus dorsi, which is for adduction. Um, radial nerve is for extension. And then dorsal scapular, oh, why am I blanking on what dorsal scapular innervates? Oh, your rhomboids, which has to do with your scapula. Okay. So question 10, a 17 year old boy with a stab wound received multiple injuries on the upper part of the arm and required surgery. If the brachial artery were ligated at its origin, which of the following arteries would supply blood to the profunda brachii artery? Okay, so once again, you gotta know your vasculature. So if the brachial artery were ligated at its origin, remember that your brachial artery starts at the um, inferior border of your teres major, which excuse me, which of the following arteries would supply blood to the profunda brachii artery? Well, 
we have to think of something that's going to get around this ligation, something that's going to go from the axillary down and then get to your profunda brachii. Well, let's see. Your superior ulnar recurrent, excuse me, superior ulnar collateral and your radial recurrent are both branches that are involved in the anastomosis around the elbow. So they would not be a part of this. They are distal to what we want. Um, your subscapular artery. So it doesn't really have any connection to your brachial artery at all. It's participating in the anastomosis around the scapula. And then the lateral thoracic artery is for the chest wall. However, your posterior humeral circumflex has an anastomotic branch that connects with your profunda brachii. So the answer, let's see. There's this really good picture in Gray's Anatomy where they show you the anastomotic branch between profunda brachii going up to posterior circumflex humeral. So if you were tied, if you tied off the brachial artery right here, the blood would still be able to get down to profunda via this anastomotic branch. Okay, question 11. A 27 year old baseball player is hit on his forearm by a high speed ball during the World Series <laughs> and muscles that form the floor of the cubital fossa floor of the cubital fossa appear to be torn. Which of the following groups of muscles have lost their functions? So this is again, just you knowing the anatomy of your cubital fossa. So you got to know all the boundaries. So the floor of our cubital fossa is our supinator and our brachialis muscle, which there's our answer right there. Brachioradialis is lateral, pronator teres is lateral. Pronator quadratus is all the way at the end, like over our wrists. So that's completely out of scope. Um, so yeah, so your answer is brachialis and supinator. Um, and remember brachialis muscle is the one that's hugging your humerus and then inserting. So you know that that one's deep. So again, your floor is brachialis and supinator. Your roof is bicepital apical neurosis. Here's your brachio brachioradialis and your pronator teres. This is two lateral portions. And you can see supinator here. And then like, um, I think this is like showing the insertion of uh, your brachialis deep. Okay. Question 12. A 23 year old man complains of numbness on the medial side of the arm following a stab wound in the axilla. So numbness on the medial side of the arm. On examination, he is diagnosed with an injury of the medial brachial cutaneous nerve, which makes sense. And which of the following structures are the cell bodies of the damaged nerve involved in numbness located? Okay, so to answer this question, you got to know the anatomy of your spinal cord. I don't recall whether or not you guys have gone over this, but if you haven't, you're about to learn a little bit of it right now. So your medial brachial cutaneous nerve is a sensory nerve. When it comes to the spinal cord, sensory nerves, um, enter the spinal cord via the dorsal root. And specifically the cell bodies of those sensory nerves are in your dorsal root ganglion. So the anterior horn of the spinal cord is for motor nerves. The lateral horn of the spinal cord is for um, sympathetics. It's where your sympathetics uh, originate. The sympathetic chain ganglions, um, that's sympathetics, but that's for um, like head and neck. And then the posterior horn of the spinal cord. Um, so the posterior horn of the spinal cord is where your sensory nerves are entering into the, uh, the spinal cord and then going up. However, where the cell bodies are specifically is this dorsal root ganglion. And so let me show you a picture and I'll go over that again. So here's our picture. So here is your, like this is a cutaway of your spinal cord. And this is your ventral horn and your dorsal horn or posterior horn, you can call them either, either one. So anterior is uh, ventral, posterior is dorsal. Motor nerves are the ventral horn, the ventral root, so anterior, versus sensory nerves are the dorsal horn, the posterior horn, the dorsal root, and then specifically the cell bodies for those sensory nerves are in your dorsal root ganglion. You can actually see in this picture how they've depicted a cell body with this blue dot right there. And then they have like the two ends of the nerve. So uh, sensory nerves, they're called like um, 
bi axonal because you have one um, cell body, but you have two axons because it goes basically fans out. So both these are like the axons for the cell body of this sensory nerve. And I believe this is from um, a, BR, a BRS book, BRS Anatomy. Okay, so question 13. A 38 year old home builder was involved in an accident and is unable to supinate his forearm. Which of the following nerves are most likely damaged? Okay, so if the patient can't supinate, then you have to ask yourself, okay, what are the muscles that supinate my forearm? And there are two. So first one is easy because it's pretty much, it's in the name, your supinator. You know that your supinator is innervated by your radial nerve. The second one, however, and this is not intuitive, it's your biceps. Your biceps brachii, its action is first supination and then flexion. It actually will not engage in flexion until your forearm is supinated. Um, and there's this fun thing that you can do where if you put your um, hand over your biceps and go from pronation to supination, you can actually feel the mus muscle engaging. So when you flex your forearm while it's pronated, that's all actually um, your brachialis muscle versus when you flip <laughs> it into supination and then you start flexing, flexing, then you can really feel your biceps engaging. So your biceps is innervated by your musculocutaneous nerve. So we've identified the two nerves involved, radial for supinator, musculocutaneous for your biceps. There's your answer, D. Um, and so you'd be able to eliminate a lot just by knowing, okay, supinator is radial. So you'd be able to eliminate A, B, and E and just get it down to C or D like pretty quickly. And then from there, it's just, okay, well, biceps is musculocutaneous, then D. Axillary, remember, is your teres minor and your deltoid. Your suprascapular is for um, supraspinatus and infraspinatus, and then, you know, median and ulnar, much lower down. So more into the form. So D, and then pronation, pronation versus supination. Um, so they show you supinator here, and then obviously your biceps is going to come down and insert as well. And there's the biceps coming down and inserting, supination, then flexion. Okay, question 14. A patient has a torn rotator cuff of the shoulder joint as the result of an automobile accident. Which of the following muscle tendons is intact and has normal function? Okay, so this is that question that I keep harping on folks when it comes to the rotator cuff muscles. You gotta know your rotator cuff muscles because they can ask you a simple question like this. And it always comes down to, do you remember if it's teres major or minor? So sits, our mnemonic for rotator cuff is your supraspinatus, your infraspinatus, your teres minor, and your subscapularis. Well, if all four of these are the muscles that are part of the rotator cuff and your rotator cuff is torn. The one that's gonna be intact is the one that is not a rotator cuff muscle. Therefore, the answer is C, teres major. Teres major is not a rotator cuff muscle. Okay, question 15. A patient bleeding from the shoulder secondary to a knife wound is in fair condition because there is, a, there is vascular anastomosis around the shoulder. Which of the following arteries is most likely a direct branch of the subclavian artery that is involved in the anastomosis? Okay, so they're asking you about the anastomosis around the scapula. Um, and then they're asking specifically what artery that's involved in the anastomosis is a direct branch of the subclavian artery. Um, I don't know if you guys have learned the subclavian artery yet. However, some of this you can, um, process and eliminate out. Um, it is much easier, however, if you've learned your subclavian artery. So we know that our circumflex scapular artery is a branch off of our um, subscapular artery. So we know that one's not correct. Um, and then I believe your thoracochromial artery is not involved in this. So you can X out that one. So you can X out B and C. And then the other ones, yeah, you'd have to know your 
your subclavian artery for the rest. So your dorsal scapular artery is the answer here. Both transverse cervical and suprascapular artery are branches off of uh, a trunk. I think it's the thyro cervical trunk. Yeah, off your thyro cervical trunk. But it's dorsal scapular artery that comes directly off of your subclavian artery. So you'll probably, if you haven't learned subclavian artery yet, if it hasn't been required, you guys will probably end up learning it for head and neck. Um, but yeah, so here's your dorsal scapular artery coming directly off of subclavian versus suprascapular is a branch off of your thyrocervical trunk as well as transverse cervical artery. Okay. Question 16. A 49 year old woman is diagnosed as having a large lump in her right breast. Lymph from the cancerous breast drains primarily into which of the following nodes? So this is you knowing your lymph node drainage um, specifically from the breast. So recall that um, you have the majority of breast cancers in the upper outer quadrant of the breast. And so the lymph nodes that are there um, are named because they're in that region. So it's the anterior or pectoral nodes. The pectoral nodes were drained into the apical nodes. Um, however, specifically coming from the breast itself is gonna go through pectoral nodes first. Your parasternal or internal thoracic nodes, um, those are more medial and that is a lower percentage of breast cancers, thankfully, because that means that we're able to catch it more. Um, your supraclavicular is gonna be after apical nodes. You actually go like uh, apical or no central and then apical, I believe, and then you get to supraclavicular. And then the nodes of the anterior abdominal wall, um, obviously, this is like lower down than most breast cancers. So this one's out of scope. And so, yep, here's your central. And then, so here's your anterior slash pectoral. And then here's your central and then subclavian nodes, and then going back into the venous system. Okay, so question 17. During a breast examination of a 56-year-old woman, the physician found a palpable mass in her breast. Which of the following characteristics of breast cancer and its diagnosis is correct? Um, I don't know if you guys have learned that much about breast cancer yet, but this was part of, I think this is the Grey's Anatomy question, and this is a blue box and more. So when it comes to breast cancer, there's this uh, phenomenon called poda orange, which you can see in some patients. Um, and poda orange is like orange peel. It's the way that the skin looks. And it looks because the cancer itself is going to end up shortening, excuse me, ends up dimpling the skin. So it looks like an orange peel. Um, polymastia is when you have more than one breast. That's not a sign of cancer. That's just a genetic variation. Um, elevated nipple, that's not what you find in cancer. You actually find an inverted nipple. And then shortening of the clavi pictorial fascia, uh, no. What we're thinking about here is shortening of the Cooper's ligaments, which are also known as your suspensory ligaments. Um, and then enlargement of the breast, you can get just from like giving birth to a baby. Um, and so the breast will fill up with milk. So that's not necessarily a part of breast cancer diagnosis. So yeah, that dimpling over the skin, the shortening of the suspensory or Cooper's ligaments leading to potent orange. Um, and then here's a picture from Moore where it's showing you like here's potent orange and then there's the retracted or nipple, the abnormal contours. Um, so yeah, and this is actually like in a patient with cancer. Okay. Question 18. A 20 year old man fell from a parallel bar during the Olympic trial. A neurologic examination revealed that, reveals that he has a lesion of the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. Which of the following muscles is most likely weakened by this injury? Okay, so once again, you gotta know your brachial plexus. So if you remember from your brachial plexus, there's only one nerve that comes off of the lateral cord and that's lateral pec. So if your lateral pectoral nerve is injured, well, what muscles is it gonna go to innervate? You're looking for pec major. And so there's our answer. Uh, Terry's minor is axillary nerve. Um, 
subscapularis comes directly off and it's read the, read the, so it's the second part of the brachial plexus, not the lateral cord trunks. There we go. Cause I'm like, what's the, the stand for? Um, and then latissimus dorsi. Oh crap. Where did you come off? I forget where latissimus dorsi comes off of the brachial plexus. Mm, bad tutor, Kristen. Um, but yeah, the answer is pec, my, pec minor. Uh, posterior cord. There we go. It's part of the posterior cord. Oh, right. Because latissimus dorsi, the thoracodorsal. Ah, thoracodorsal, which is your uh, middle subscapular, which is off of the medial cord. Okay, but yes, process of elimination. So here's your lateral pec coming off of the lateral cord. Okay, question 19. A seven-year-old boy falls from a tree house and is brought to the emergency department of a local hospital. On examination, he has weakness in rotating his arm laterally, so weakness in lateral rotation, because of injury of a nerve. Which of the following conditions is most likely to cause a loss of this nerve's function? Okay. So we're looking for our lateral rotators of the arm. And then we're looking, or we're looking at a lateral rotator of the arm and a condition that would cause this nerve to lose its function. <clears throat> so there's multiple rotators of the arm, lateral rotators on the arm, but one that came to mind that I was thinking of immediately, especially when it comes to like damage would be axillary nerve. Um, so looking at our answers for A, injury to the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. Well, lateral cord of the brachial plexus is still our lateral pec nerve and that's only like pec major or minor and they don't do lateral rotation. So we don't have to worry about that. So we know that one's wrong. B, a fracture of the anatomic neck of the humerus. So we don't really talk about the anatomical neck of the humerus. We talk about the surgical neck. So that sort of hinted me, that hints me at maybe they're trying to get you to pick that for axillary nerve. So we know that one's wrong. We don't talk about the fracture of the anatomical neck. A knife wound on the teres major muscle. Um, so teres major, it doesn't do lateral rotation. It does medial rotation. So that's not correct. Inferior dislocation of the head of the humerus. Well, inferior dislocation of the head of the humerus would cause um, loss of nerve function in the axillary nerve. So I think this might be our answer. And then E, a tumor in the triangular space in the shoulder region. Well, the triangular space is where um, the circumflex scapular artery goes through. So that's not correct. It's the quadrangular space um, is where axillary nerve is. And so now I'm fairly certain that the answer of this is D. Um, so inferior dislocation of the head of the humerus because um, when you dislocate your humerus, it'll drop down because of gravity because there's nothing below it. Um, so yeah, I think the answer to this is D. And it is, yes. Inferior dislocation of the head of the humerus may damage the axillary nerve, which arises from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, runs through the quadrangular space accompanied by the posterior humeral circumflex vessels around the surgical neck of the humerus and supplies the deltoid and teres minor, which are lateral rotators of the arm. And there you go. So that was an example of when you're not quite sure process of elimination, <laughs> you're just like, I think this is what it's asking, but let me look at what they give me and let me see if it confirms my assumption and usually that will help you. Um, there's usually with these questions when you have to do process of elimination when you're not quite sure, there's usually one or two you can automatically cross off because you're like, that doesn't make any sense. And then the other two you can kind of like logic it out. So question 20. A patient with a stab wound receives a laceration of the musculocutaneous nerve. Which of the following conditions is most likely to occur, to have occurred? Okay, so musculocutaneous nerve, what do we know about the musculocutaneous nerve? It innervates the three muscles in the anterior um, proximal arm compartment, and its terminal branch is the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve. So we're going to think about those three muscles, and we're going to think about that terminal branch when we're looking at the possible answer. So if we lacerate our musculocutaneous nerve, lack of sweating on the lateral side of the forearm, that's a possibility because we have that lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve. So that might be the right answer. Uh, B, inability to extend the forearm. Well, we know this is wrong because um, extension in the upper limb is via radial nerve and we're dealing with musculocutaneous nerves. So it's not that one. 
paralysis of your brachioradialis muscle. Again, this is radial nerve, so both B and C out. Loss of tactile sensation on the arm. Um, no, tactile sensation on the arm, we know that's the medial brachial cutaneous nerve and a little bit of axillary, we're dealing with musculocutaneous nerve. And then constriction of blood vessels on the hand. I don't think lateral antibrachial cutaneous has anything to do with that. So I'm gonna go with A for this one. And the answer is A. So the musculocutaneous nerve contains sympathetic postganglionic fibers that supply sweat glands and blood vessels on the lateral side of the arm as the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve. The musculocutaneous nerve does not supply the extensors of the forearm and the brachial radialis. Remember, that's radial nerve. This nerve also supplies tactile sensation on the lateral side of the forearm, not the arm. Be careful. Make sure you read forearm versus arm. They will try and get you and then supplies blood vessels on the lateral side of the forearm, but not the hand. Okay, great. Um, so good guess on that one. And here again is our musculocutaneous nerve. Never forget that terminal branch of the lateral uh, cutaneous nerve of the forearm or lateral antibrachial cutaneous. They both are the same thing. It's just whether or not it's in the Latin. Okay, question 21. A rock climber falls on his shoulder, resulting in a chipping off of the lesser tubercle of the humerus. Which of the following structures would most likely have structural and functional damage? Okay, so this requires you knowing what attaches at the lesser tubercle of the humerus. Um, so when, <clears throat> when I'm unsure about these, I think about, okay, where is the lesser tubercle? If a muscle were to attach there, what kind of action would it have? Um, and so I know for this, for the lesser tubercle, I know that it's subscapularis that attaches there because it does medial rotation. So I just kind of like remember that. Versus, um, so coracohumeral ligament, uh, the coracobrachialis goes into our coracoid process. Uh, I believe Terry's minor does greater tubercle. Uh, Infraspinatus, I think, also does. And then supraspinatus is at the, um, is that greater tubercle as well? I know it's at the top part. Like, it's more um, superior of the humerus where it attaches. Um, but yeah, I know it's subscapularis for the lesser tubercle. Here we go. The supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor insert in the greater tubercle. There you go. And then the coracohumeral ligament attached to the greater tubercle. OK, I need to look up what the coracohumeral ligament is. But yeah, all the rest of them attach to the greater tubercle. It's just the subscapularis attaches to the lesser tubercle of the humerus. Um, I do have a pretty good picture in here. Yes. So you can see over here on the bones, um, here is your lesser tubercle versus here is your greater tubercle. And usually when they name them like that, it literally is the greater tubercle is bigger and the lesser tubercle is smaller. And then between them is your intertubercular your groove. And then here, this is from Netter. This is from Moore. Um, here you can see how your subscapularis originating on your scapula and then it's inserting here on the lesser tubercle. Lesser tubercle. Okay. All right, question 22. A 21 year old patient has a lesion of the upper trunk of the brachial plexus, herb to shame palsy. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Okay. When you have that herb Duchenne palsy, remember the arm is gonna have that waiter's tip um, uh, positioning of the arm where it's extended, excuse me, the wrist is flexed, it's medially rotated, it's adducted. Um, and then also you wanna think about if it's the upper trunk of the brachial plexus, C5, C6, what uh, nerves could possibly be injured in an upper trunk injury? So let's see. Paralysis of your rhomboid major. Your rhomboids are innervated by your dorsal scapular. So I think that actually might be the right one. Hold on, arm tending to lie in medial rotation. Oh, that is Herb Duchesne. Yeah, loss of sensation on the medial side of the arm that comes off of the brachial plexus that's not upper trunk. Inability to adduct the thumb, that's ulnar nerve, so D and E are out. Um, inability to elevate the arm above the horizontal. That is serratus anterior long thoracic. Ooh, this is going to be a tricky one. What do you remember? 
So, so uh, I want to pick C because it's waiter's tip, even though I'm like, but A, B, or C could be right. All right, well, you guys get to see if I'm right or wrong because I don't remember this one. But arm tending to line, medial rotation, inability to elevate the arm above the horizontal, the paralysis of front point major. I think it's C. It is, okay. <laughs> it is the waiter's tip formation. Now I need to read why all the rest of them are wrong though. Uh, yeah, dorsal scapular, which arises from the root C5, innervates the rhomboid major. If you have an upper trunk injury, why wouldn't this also be correct? Okay. Um, stress interior muscle. Yeah, C5, C6, C5, C6. Okay, this is annoying. Um, because the way that this question was worded, that's why A, B, and C all could have been correct. But I think what they wanted you to get out of it is that since they told you it was herb Duchenne palsy, it's like, what does that look like? That's really what they were trying to ask in this question is what does herb Duchenne palsy look like in a patient? And it's C, arm tending to line and medial rotation. Um, because with herb Duchenne palsy, you wouldn't just have A or B, you would have C. I think that's what they were trying to get you to go towards. I don't like it when they do these questions like this because if it's not clear, you could catch people in A or B, but the answer is C. And I didn't, so full disclosure, I did not write these questions. I pulled them from either Gray's Anatomy questions or BRS. But yeah. And then here's that waiter's tip. Okay. So our final three questions for this video, um, they're all gonna be based off of this vignette. So a 37 year old female patient has a fracture of the clavicle. The junction of the middle and lateral thirds of the bone exhibits overriding of the medial and lateral fragments. So picture this in your head. Fracture of the clavicle, overriding fragments. The arm is rotated medially, but it is not rotated laterally. Well, yeah, cause you just told us it was rotated medially. Okay. Question 23. The lateral portion of the fractured clavicle is displaced downward by which of the following? All right. So this is basically asking you to know what is attached to your clavicle and what would have a downward force um, on that lateral portion of your clavicle. So the muscles that we know that are like touching the clavicle. Um, so and I'm not talking about like lateral versus medial, just touching them at all. So we know sternocleidomastoid is in the area. We know that trapezius is in the area. We know that our deltoid is in the area. So, um, and we know that our pec mi major is in the area. Pec minor, remember, and source of cord cord process. You can just eliminate this off rip. Um, oh, and this one as well. If you see pec minor, it goes away. So that leaves us with A, B, and E. Well, I remember that trapezius, it's, wants to lift up the portions of the clavicle that's attached to versus trapezius and deltoid actually have opposite um, like mirror image of where they're attaching to the clavicle. So I would eliminate this because these two muscles would uh, cancel each other out. Because if you look at their origin insertion, they make like this C, which is actually pretty cool um, for their attachments to both the scapula and the clavicle. So I would eliminate A as well. Leaving, leaving either your pec major and deltoid or just deltoid and gravity. Well, I remember that the pec major, um, its origin is more medial than lateral. Um, so I would go with your deltoid muscle and gravity and gravity just makes sense because gravity is gonna pull it down because it's displaced downwards. Um, and so yes, the answer was E. It is your deltoid as well as gravity. So it's not showing you the deltoid here, but the deltoid um, originates here and then inserts down on your humerus. I think it's the deltoid tuberosity. You can see how your pec major is more medial. Here's your sternocleidomastoid, here's your trapezius. Um, and so here's the actual overlay of that scapula when it's fractured. And just as a note, um, this can be a foosh injury too. Yes, I know. Falling on your outstretched hand can cause a lot of different fractures depending on where the force of the injury ends up. Um, but you can see how you have this lateral fragment that displaced underneath the medial fragment. Okay, so gravity pulling it down along with your deltoid. Okay, 
which of the following muscles causes upward displacement of the medial fragment, which I kind of sort of just told you from that when we were looking at it, uh, but we'll go over it anyway. So remember your pec major, um, it's not really going to pull upwards because it's inferior to your clavicle, so you can nix that one out. Same with deltoid, it's inferior, so it can't pull it upwards. Um, that leaves us with trapezius, sternocleidomastoid, and your scalenes. Um, trapezius, remember, is mirroring your deltoid, so that's going to be more lateral than medial. And then scalenes, oh, I forget where the scalenes insert, but I think it's your sternocleidomastoid, so we'll see. It is your sternocleidomastoid. Um, so let's look at a picture again. Here's your sternocleidomastoid and it's pulling up here. And I like the name of the sternocleidomastoid because it tells you <laughs> the things that it's attaching to. So sternocleido and mastoid, sterno meaning the sternum, clido meaning the clavicle, and then mastoid is like the mastoid process that's um, on your skull. So it tells you like the three things that it's attached to and it's the one that's pulling upward on that medial fragment. Okay, now final question. Which of the following conditions is most likely to occur secondary to the fracture of the clavicle? All right, so this one you have to do process of elimination because they don't really give you much. Um, so you know you fracture your clavicle, what else could happen? Like what could be a secondary thing that happens because you fractured your clavicle? So A, a fatal hemorrhage from the brachiocephalic vein. All right, so your brachiocephalic vein is not underneath your clavicle. That's more, um, it's more inferior. Um, than where your clavicle is. Uh, thrombosis of the subclavian vein causing a pulmonary embolism. Well, your subclavian vein is underneath your clavicle because remember you have your clavicle, your subclavius muscle, and then the veins because we have the veins more superficial um, because they have uh, less pressure from the pumping versus your subclavian artery is gonna be deep to the vein. So we know it's not this one. Um, damage to the upper trapezoid of brachial plexus, eh, that's more on the axilla. And then damage to the long thoracic nerve causing wing scapula. That's more at the roots. Um, so I would go with B, thrombosis of the subclavian vein causing a pulmonary embolism. Excuse me, and that is correct. So you can see how here's your clavicle and then there's your subclavian vein underneath. I think I have a better picture. Yes, here's a better picture where they have cut away the clavicle. You can see here's your subclavius muscle and then right there, your subclavian vein, and then it's subclavian artery, and then it's nerves. Um, so a mnemonic you can use when it comes to remembering structures like this is vein, vein, artery, nerve. It tends to be that you'll have the vein most superficial and then the artery and then the nerve. So vein, vein, artery, nerve. And I believe that's, yep, that was the last question. So. I know I tried to go slow, but I like go through these and then I start talking. Um, when you're looking at these questions, take a moment, realize process of elimination is your friend. Make sure you read the question and read it well, read the answers and read them well, because you don't want to get tripped up on Terry's major versus minor. You don't want to get tripped up on arm versus forearm, because those are easy ways they can try and trick you when you know this information and you just happen to read too fast. And I'm definitely one of those people where when I was doing um, my test, I had to tell myself to slow down. Um, when you go further on in your studies, uh, there will be some more tricks to help you when uh, you're answering these questions, especially since the further on you go in your training, the longer the questions will be. Oftentimes it'll be something along the lines of read the last sentence first, because that's the actual question that you need to get the information from. Um, the previous like paragraph that they get you, give you. Um, and then on occasion, it will just be a one step question, but it's not very often that you get one steps. Um, sometimes you'll get two and three and four steps. Um, and I think we've had a couple of those in here today, but hopefully this can help you as you're going through. If you wanna go back and practice, go ahead and pause after I read the question or pause to try and figure out the question yourself and then listen to me explaining it. Um, and like I said, this PowerPoint and this video are available to you to help you practice. Hopefully it will help. Um, otherwise, y'all have a good one.